Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lab Tools webinar. I'm Betsy Young, Director of Creative Services for the Scientist, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Today, our speaker, John Cadwell, will be discussing hollow fiber bioreactors and their ability to promote a physiologically relevant interaction between cells while enabling product retrieval without perturbation. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, to, and the speaker will address these during the Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question, simply click on the Ask a Question tab and type your query into the question box located on the bottom left of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. Our webinar platform is user-friendly. You can expand the presentation window by simply clicking on the diametrically opposed arrows in the upper right-hand corner. This will maximize the display within your screen. The webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and we'll send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor. FiberCell Systems is the premier worldwide supplier of hollow fiber bioreactors for the research market. Hollow fiber bioreactors create an in vivo-like environment for cells and culture, resulting in the superior production of secreted products, such as antibodies, recombinant proteins, exosomes, and conditioned medium. They allow any laboratory easy cell culture scale up with 100 times greater efficiency. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful resources related to hollow fiber bioreactors, and we've posted these in our resource list located on the left of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our speaker, John Cadwell, President and CEO of FiberCell Systems. He has designed, developed, and supported a complete line of laboratory-scale hollow fiber bioreactor systems for the culture of mammalian cells, insect cells, and PKPD studies on pathogenic bacteria and antibiotics. His key achievements include launching a new line of magnetic beads for cell separation and developing protocols for stem cell isolation, doubling sales of electrophoresis equipment in the southeast over a two-year period of time, as well as multiple issued patents covering a production-scale hollow fiber bioreactor. He has managed all aspects of marketing, sales, product development, and application development for hollow fiber systems. He is a world-respected expert in the use of hollow fiber bioreactors for all applications. He has also chaired conference sessions, given scientific talks, and presented posters at meetings around the world. John? Thanks very much for the kind introduction, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm happy to be here to be able to talk to you about uh, hollow fiber bioreactors and also hopefully we'll come away with a little better understanding of standard flask culture and uh, some of its limitations and factors that affect your research. Hollow fiber is not a new technique, it's actually been around since 1972. It was developed by Richard Nasik at the NIH and he was looking to develop a more in vivo like way, a more three-dimensional way to culture cells. Um, it's really only been in the last few years that we've learned about what the real power of hollow fiber bioreactors can deliver and uh, the differences in terms of how cells behave um, in their physiology when cultured in three dimensions at high density in a hollow fiber bioreactor. Uh, so we can kind of start with the Michener approach to cell culture and harken back to 1906 and Harrison who was the first to attempt to produce culture cells in vitro. Um, and he was actually utilizing frog neuronal explants on plasma clots, a three-dimensional matrix for culturing cells. Through the years, we've gone from using glass flasks and now to plastic flasks. Um, it's actually relatively new technology. I was in graduate school in 1980 and don't recall too many laminar flow hoods or incubators or cell culture being performed in the laboratories around me. It really took, um, you know, historically the development of uh, digestive enzymes from Worthington in the late 40s and early 50s to do tissues of dissociation, the development of cell lines in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, it was a very rigorous um, and dogmatic technique uh, until we had laminar flow hoods developed, uh, which were in the mid-70s. So in the historical sense, it's really quite surprising to me how ubiquitous cell culture is as a research tool um, and how relatively recent the technology is. So we moved from flasks 
uh, to roller bottles. Biology is all about cell culture and surface area when we want to perform scale up. Um, and uh, we can look at different ways of growing cells, but fundamentally the methodology is utilizing um, putting cells onto a non-porous two-dimensional surface. Um, and we utilize generally serum as a supplement for culturing the cells. Um, serum in and of itself is relatively non-physiologic. Um, serum is plasma with the clotting factors removed, so the only time that cells will see uh, or be exposed to serum is when they're in an activated state. Um, and the growth of cells on a two-dimensional non-porous support means that we must maintain cells in a monolayer configuration, um, and this is a, also a non-physiologic way of growing cells. Uh, when we go to scale up our cell culture, we can look at things like roller bottles, <coughs> cell factory, cell cube. These are all just ways of getting more surface area into a certain amount of space. Um, and other options for cell cu culture scale up will include bags, um, spinner flasks, uh, bioreactors such as a 50 liter bioreactor that's uh, pictured here. This is also a non-physiologic way of growing cells at low density one to five times 10 to the, sec, 10 to the six cells per mil. Um, in a uh, suspension type culture, we have to put surfactants into the media to protect the cell membranes from the shear so the cells are exposed to a lot of different physical shear forces as well. All of these methods to a greater or lesser degree are gonna subject the cells to what we call a feast or famine, which is a non-homeostatic um, process of growing cells in which the cell culture conditions are constantly changing. Um, so we're familiar with, of course, uh, lag phase. Even though we put in the cells, we see the cells into a flask, they still uh, take a little bit of time to condition their cell environment around them with their own cytokines and growth factors. Um, so it takes a little while for the cells, even in the presence of serum and on plastic, to begin to proliferate. <clears throat> then we have our optimum cell culture conditions, and here we define optimal cell culture conditions as being that which gives us the best monoclonal antibody production, but I utilize this as a uh, monitor for uh, all types of cell physiology and cell health. Um, and just when things are getting good, it's time to split the cells because they've reached confluence and we must maintain them in a monolayer subconfluent fashion because in flasks, Nutrients come from the top down. Nutrients and oxygen come from the top down. So if the cells pile up on top of one another, um, they block the delivery of nutrients and oxygen to the bottom layer of cells and everything dies, peels off, and floats away. So it's important then to understand that the growth of cells on a non-porous two-dimensional plastic surface in the presence of serum um, is an inherently non physiologic process, although it still has been a valuable tool for use in research and has certainly have widespread um, utilization all around the world. But wouldn't it be nice if we could maintain the cells at their more homeostatic conditions? Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to split the cells, if we didn't have to digest them every two days and move them to a new plastic dish? It would be nice if we could maintain them um, in their most homeostatic cell culture environment for extended periods of time. And in point of fact, that's what we do with a hollow fiber bioreactor. It is mimicking the human circulatory system. And in fact, the world record for continuous culture of a glioma cell line in a hollow fiber bioreactor is two years of continuous culture and continuous production of a glioma cell line. In one of our cartridges, we typically can culture hybridomas for as long as six months or even up to a year of continuous culture, continuous production with no change in antibody affinity, avidity, or glycosylation patterns. Chosen 293s, we can typically grow for six, three to six months worth of continuous production. So hollow fiber cell culture is based on the principle that each one of these fibers inside the cartridge is like a little filter, and it's shaped like a drinking straw, 200 microns in diameter. Inside the cartridge are literally thousands of these fibers, about 4,000 to 7,000 fibers. We seal the fibers up in the end in a medical grade polyurethane and then trim off the ends so that only the open ends of the fibers are available to the end port of the cartridge. So any media that is pumped through the insides of the fiber necessarily goes through the insides of the fiber and typically we grow the cells on the outside of the fiber. So what we've done is created a semi-permeable barrier of defined molecular weight cutoff between the area in which the media is flowing 
and the cells are growing. This differs from traditional flask culture in three important and fundamentally different ways. The first is that we have a tremendous amount of surface area in a really small space. And as I mentioned earlier, biology is all about surface area, surface area to volume ratio. So our standard cartridge, the C2011 cartridge, has 3,000 square centimeters of surface area in a volume of 20 mils. So we have 150 square centimeters of surface area per milliliter volume. Our larger cartridge, the C2018, has 1.2 square meters of surface area in a volume of 60 mils. So we have an even higher surface area to volume ratio. Uh, we have 200 square centimeters of surface area per milliliter volume. So you can imagine a film that's 50 microns thick on a, laid out on a flat plastic plate. Um, this is the kind of surface area to volume ratio that we have. This is what allows us to grow cells at extremely high densities, at one to two times 10 to the eight cells per mil. It is the only way to culture cells and to maintain cells at in vivo-like cell densities. Here in the, in the photo, you can see these are actually lymphocytes growing at approximately one to two times 10 to the eight cells per mil, tissue-like cell density. Secondly, the cells are bound to a porous support, not a non-porous plastic dish. The nutrients come from the bottom up, not from the top down. This is what allows us to culture the cells for extremely long periods of time. This is what allows us to grow cells in three dimensions. Uh, passage number is irrelevant, and splitting the cells is not required. Thirdly, we can control the pore size of the fiber, anywhere from 5,000 Daltons up to 0.1 microns. So the idea is that small things like glucose, lactate, ammonia, uh, nutrients and waste products can freely cross the fiber. Larger things that are secreted by the cells, such as proteins, antibodies, viruses, um, exosomes, cannot cross the fiber. So they'll be retained by the fiber and concentrated to a very high degree, anywhere from 50 to 100 times higher concentrations than what you can get out of standard bioreactors. Um, it's important when you're dealing with hollow fiber to understand exactly what a molecular weight cutoff is. So we have a 5,000 Dalton and a 20,000 Dalton fiber. Um, it's important to remember then that the Dalton is a fundamental me unit of uh, measurement of mass, and a Dalton is equivalent to the mass of a hydrogen atom. It was uh, defined by Sir Joseph Dalton in 1786 at Cambridge University in the UK. So a Dalton is the mass of a hydrogen atom, and a hydrogen atom is the smallest intact atomic particle that you can have before you start going subatomic. Um, Nowadays, NIST likes to define the Dalton as one twelfth the mass of a carbon atom because um, they like to re relate everything to carbon, but it's fundamentally the same thing. So we can then understand that the average mass, the average molecular weight of an amino acid is around 120, and we could take something like an antibody, an IgG1, and its molecular weight is 144,000 Daltons. So by this, then we can understand that um, and IgG1 and antibody will have approximately 1,200 amino acids making it up. So these three things, the high surface area to volume ratio, the fact that cells are bound to a porous support, and the ability to control the environment around the cells and to concentrate their secreted products are the three uh, factors that are fundamentally different and represent a unique cell culture environment versus flask culture and other types of uh, bioreactor methods. So as I mentioned, this is just a uh, picture of the cells at high density. We're looking at 10 to the 8th plus cells per mil. Um, in our particular system, we utilize wavy fibers, so the fiber bundle pushes against each other inside the cartridge, so they're uniformly distributed inside the cartridge shell. Um, so these cartridges are optimized for both suspension and adherent cells. Um, it's this high cell density that permits adapt adaptation to lower serum concentrations and to our protein-free media that we've developed specifically for hollow fiber uh, bioreactor culture, CDMHD, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so the system itself is a closed biosafe system. Um, we have a central reservoir that contains the media, and the media recirculates through the cartridge. We utilize a pumping system. We actually have a specific positive pressure displacement pump that we've developed for this system. We call it a squishy pump. It's not a peristaltic pump because peristaltic pumps are friction-based and will shed plastic off the pump tubing um, and clog up the, the, uh, the fiber bundle. 
and also it's very difficult to utilize a paracelic pump to generate 80 to 160 mils a minute recirculation rate, which is what we use with the hollow fiber system. Um, in any bioreactor, the rate limiting factor is generally not the uh, delivery of nutrients and removal of waste products, but the delivery of oxygen and removal of CO2. So we utilize a loop of thin-walled silicone tubing. Um, the standard cartridge has two meters of this tubing. Uh, to provide oxygen exchange and CO2 removal. It's very highly gas permeable. So that's where the gas exchange takes place. So the media just continuously recirculates, um, and we just simply measure the glucose that's present in the media in the central reservoir and harvest our product uh, on a schedule based upon our protocols. Um, So here at the, where I'm based at in Frederick, we have U.S. Amherst just down the road, and um, they're very much involved in uh, different types of uh, interesting biology. And uh, we had some protocols and discussions with them in the past about um, producing a virus. And they called me up once and they said, oh, we'd like to produce a virus. And I said, okay, uh, what kind of virus do you want to produce? And they said, well, we, we can't tell you that. And I said, okay. I said, um, what kind of cells do you want to grow the virus in? And I said, oh, African green monkey kidney cells. And I said, oh, okay, so you want to grow Ebola? And they laughed, and they said, no, no, no. They said, time to burst with Ebola, i.e., the time from when a virus hits the cell and the cell bursts. Time to burst with Ebola is 12 hours, and time to burst with our virus is four hours, so it's actually three times as virulent as Ebola. And they definitely appreciated the fact that this was a closed biosafe system. So this is just a breakout of how the cartridge is put together. You can see the loop of silicone tubing in the back, and we have two one-way check valves um, that works just like your heart. And then our pump piston will squeeze on this pump tubing that you can see coming up from the, uh, in the back of the flow path. So it squeezes on that tubing and utilizes the one-way check valves to generate the flow rate. And you can see the loop of silicone tubing where the gas exchange takes place. So the system is designed to fit inside any standard-sized incubator. Temperature is controlled by the incubator. Gas is controlled by the incubator. It's a very simple system um, without any kind of fancy sensors or anything like that. It's all going to be measured uh, manually. And we utilize a thin cord for power, so we don't have to worry about having a plug inside the incubator. Um, and uh, it's uh, very convenient to put inside the incubator and to take out again. So when working with the cartridge, we can pull the cartridge out of the duet pump and move it into the hood. So it's um, both the easiest and the most difficult uh, process uh, cartridge to contaminate. While it's outside of the hood, it's going to be sealed. When it's inside the hood, it's um, very important to utilize good sterile technique. Good sterile technique is always plus. Um, maintenance is only 15 minutes a day. We want to just measure the glucose and um, harvest our product. Um, as we mentioned, good sterile technique is always a plus. And here in this particular example, it's important to notice this nice young lady happens to not be wearing a lab coat. So we want to be sure that we follow good sterile technique whenever we're working with the cartridge. So we're going to measure the glucose. And the glucose measurement is very important. It tells us directly what's going on inside the cartridge. The total amount of glucose in the media tells us when it's time to change the bottle. All we have to do is unscrew the bottle and put on a fresh one. Um, so generally, we'll change the media before the pH is shifted. And we'll change it when the glucose is about 50% depleted. Uh, typically, we'll work with DMEM. And starting glucose on DMEM is 4.5 grams per liter. So when it gets down to about 2 grams per liter, it's time to change the media. Uh, so we just unscrew the bottle and put on a fresh one. The glucose uptake rate or the amount of glucose consumed in a 24-hour period of time is a direct indicator of how many cells we have in the cartridge, how happy they are, how healthy they are, what's going on. As long as the glucose uptake rate is either plateauing or increasing, everything's good inside the cartridge. If you see that it drops, that means that something is uh, amiss inside our cartridge, and we want to take a look at what's going on. Um, the glucose uptake rate for this cartridge will typically be in the range of 1 to 1.5 grams per day. This is going to be directly representative by about 1 times 10 to the ninth cells. 
So the applications that we'll talk about today, certainly monoclonal antibody production, um, hybridoma culture is one of the, one of the basic raison d'etre for hollow fiber when it was developed back in the um, early 80s for commercial applications. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a second. Recombinant protein production, um, it is certainly a way of producing anywhere from 10 milligrams on up to gram quantities of recombinant protein from a mammalian expression system uh, in um, of small volumes. Um, conditioned medium, of course, we have a lot of exciting um, applications now for exosomes. Um, it is a physiologically relevant way of culturing endothelial cells under shear stress. Um, and cell co-cultivation and other types of uh, cell culture models. And also very important that we're excited to be involved with, but I won't get into too much detail for this particular audience, is going to be the use of the system for antibiotic pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics for determining resistance generation and best dosage profiles and uh, total kill uh, and two drug models for antibiotic applications, which is, of course, going to be quite critical these days. So this is a cartridge. This is going to show uh, the kind of cell densities that we can achieve. It's a little bit of an extreme uh, uh, picture of it, but we can see the cells that uh, collect in the ends of the cartridge. This is because the diameter of the cartridge expands slightly at the end so that we don't have the potting material running up the sides of the cartridge due to ca um, capillary action. But we can see that the density is, is uniform really throughout the entire cartridge. It's just more visible at the ends. Um, but this is what cells look like when they're growing at 10 to the 8 cells per mil. Um, so the advantages overall for hollow fiber cell culture is our product is going to be more concentrated, generally 50 to 100 times more concentrated than what you'll see out of regular standard flask or spinner culture. Um, we will demonstrate uniform and complete post-translational modifications over extended periods of time. I believe this is due to the improved and more physiologic cell culture environment that the cells are growing in. Uh, we also see significantly less apoptosis. Um, may not be exactly the right definition of the word. What we see is low rates of cell lysis. So it's really surprising to me when we work with this that we'll see lots of dead cells as part of the growth process, but very little cell fragments, less contamination with intercellular proteins and DNA and membrane fragments and these kinds of things. Um, and we'll show the consistency of this production over many months. Um, and then, of course, we have developed our own in-house CDMHD, chemically defined media for high-density culture. Um, you don't have to use CDMHD with our system. You can work with just about any media that you like, although we find that um, the more expensive a media is, the more complex a media it is, um, the less well it seems to work with our system. So CDMHD, to me, is not just a protein-free, chemically defined, animal component-free, CGMP-compliant serum re uh, replacement. It has actually been simplified and modified and optimized for use in our hollow fiber bioreactor. Um, and to me, it's really more a manifestation, a direct physical manifestation of the different cell culture environment found in a hollow fiber bioreactor because CDMHD does not work in flash culture. CDMHD does not work in spinner culture. The cells need to be at higher density before we can support them with CDMHD. Um, so typically we'll culture the cells and inoculate the cells at low density in the cartridge with serum. And then as the cells grow, we get them up to high density we can simply switch over to CDMHD. It really doesn't even require any adaptation. Kind of surprising. Um, so as I said, it's optimized and simplified for the hollow fiber bioreactor. Importantly also, since the cells, the cells do not experience any shear within the system, um, there's no requirement for surfactants to protect the cell membrane from shear. Um, it's chemically defined, protein-free, um, I'm also kind of surprised by the number of components. There's about 92 different um, components in CDMHD. Um, it has some heaps to stabilize the pH. It has uh, a little bit of extra glucose. It's got a lot of amino acids in there. If you want to make protein, you need amino acids. It has micronutrients. It has all kinds of things in there. Um, and it is CGMP compliant. If you do want to utilize it in a CGMP compliant process, um, we can 
um, with the proper paperwork and NDA in place provide you with um, information on the components that are contained within. So we can get very high lot-to-lot -lot consistency. We can ship this at ambient, store it at uh, four degrees, uh, three-year shelf life on CDMHD from date of manufacture. Uh, so this is an example of monoclonal antibody production utilizing CDMHD. Um, as I stated earlier, hybridomas was kind of the raison d'etre for the development of um, hollow fiber bioreactors in their first main application. And this is because uh, of the biology behind monoclonal antibodies. So Cesar Milstein got the Nobel Prize in 1978 for his hybridoma technology, um, along with the, one of his coworkers. Um, to make a hybridoma, you take a B cell and you fuse it with a cancer cell to immortalize it. But one of the ways that cancer cells locally immune suppress um, or inhibit the activity of um, B cells is to secrete TGF beta. So Cesar Milstein knew that when he did this, did this process that he was making a cell that inhibits its own growth. So B cells secrete T, uh, cancer cells secrete TGF beta. Its molecular weight's around 27,000 Daltons in its active form, and it will directly inhibit hybridoma growth and production. So hollow fiber utilizes its molecular weight cutoff, so we allow the TGF beta to diffuse away and trap the antibody, 147,000 Daltons trap the antibody in a small volume of the ECS. So hybridomas will grow faster than any, in, in hollow fiber bioreactor than in any other type of system and will also have much higher specific productivity when you can get rid of the TGF beta. So any method that doesn't incorporate the removal of TGF beta from the hybridoma culture um, is not taking advantage of the fundamental biology that's involved with hybridomas. Um, in this particular case, uh, this is Aaron Bromage at the uh, University of uh, Amherst, and he's part of the National Veterinary Diagnostics um, Antibody Consortium. Uh, and this is just kind of a general example. I'll say this is above average data, but I do like to point out that this is not a purified uh, product. This is simply a straight harvest. You take the cells and spin them down and then ran the gels. Now, admittedly, this is not the most sensitive of gels, but I think it's still pretty impressive when you can see that approximately, we'll say 85% of the protein that's present in the harvest is antibody product, uh, which is some small molecular weight schmutz that we find on the bottom of the gel. Uh, for his first hybridoma, he produced about 168 milligrams of antibody and 60 mils of harvest, average productivity of 2.8 milligrams per mil, consumed nine liters of media in three weeks worth of cultures, the other antibodies pretty similar, uh, 159 megs and 70 mils volume, average concentration 2.3 megs per mil, and consumed 11 liters of media in three weeks. Typically, our C2011 cartridge will consume a liter of media every two days. We like to harvest every other day. So we typically see a concentration of somewhere between 0.5 and 5 megs per mil, and productivity of between 5 and 50 megs of antibody every two days. Another issue with hollow fiber is that we can, in fact, um, utilize uh, antibiotic-free culture system. And in this case, then, we can have very low endotoxin. So if endotoxin, is a, endotoxin burden is a concern, um, this, the small volume of the harvest can facilitate lower endotoxin because endotoxin tends to, co, uh, tends to be volume dependent and co-purify with antibodies sometimes. So the smaller the volume you have to deal with, the lower endotoxin burden that you'll have to clean up later. And we've produced over uh, monoclonal antibody for over six months. In fact, the record is held by the Duke University Monoclonal Antibody Core Facility. They set up a cartridge in January of one year and then closed it down um, so they could go on Christmas break uh, that following December. This is an example of a um, large recombinant protein produced in a CHO cell. That's an extremely large protein. It's six IgG1 subunits held together with three IgA tails. Uh, I call it a real Franken protein. Um, and in this particular case, the top trace is the um, product that comes from the cells grown in flash culture. We take those exact same cells, 
Um, we see them into the hollow fiber bioreactor, and we can see in the top trace about 40% of the protein is produced as an improperly folded monomeric subunit, and in the hollow fiber cartridge, 95% plus of the protein is expressed as a properly folded hexamer. So it's these improved cell culture conditions that result in uniform and complete post-translation modifications of a very complex and difficult to express protein um, in a mammalian expression system. So in this particular case, this is an image of the protein in question, so we can see, and I'm always amazed to look at this for several reasons. First off, this is not a computerized drawing. This is an actual cryo-electron tomograph. Uh, and we can see one, two, three, four, five, six IgG1 subunits held together with three IgA tails. And what uh, Dr. James Arthos has done here is substituted the FB region of the antibody for CD4 receptor. So he's made a dodecaramized uh, CD4 receptor, 12 CD4 receptors all in a big loop. And you can see here they're binding to GP120 on HIV. So this is a protein that was designed to cross-link HIV and activate it. And in fact, he produced 500 milligrams of protein in a volume of about five liters in a period of about 45 days using our system and utilize this for animal, animal research. Um, the other thing about this slide that I find impressive and sometimes a little bit depressing is this, I look at the date and I see it's the Journal of Biological Chemistry, September 2007, and I remember being so excited when this came out, and now I look and I see it's 11 years ago, so I wonder where the time went. Um, Here's an example of some raw harvest from a Cho cell line, and they did some interesting and a little bit different things with media change, but the fundamental uh, thing to look at is on the left, we can see um, measurement of cell viability, and we can't see it directly, but I can tell you here the cells are about 5% viable. I normally don't like to say, oh, gee, look at all the dead cells, but in this case we're going to say, oh, gee, look at all the dead cells. And on the right, again, we can see um, in lane two, where it says harvested media, two, four, six, eight, that's a number of days. Um, this, again, is non-purified product. So even though we have 95% non-viable cells in this particular instance, we still have a fairly clean supernatant of our target protein being produced and chose. This is another difficult to express protein. Um, it is a cytokine that is co-expressed with its receptor, so it's an interleukin receptor complex. Um, it's highly glycosylated, 45% sugar. Um, the only thing holding the two subunits together are the uh, hydrophobic interaction between the receptor ligand um, um, affinity. Um, and so we can see the productivity isn't great. It's around 50 micrograms per mil per day. Uh, we are able to produce gram quantities of this protein with our collaborator at NCI. And the important thing about this is to see that even after 137 days of continuous culture, there's no change in expression pattern, no change in glycosylation, um, no change in expression. So what we see is that a single harvest from a 2011 can equal 20 roller bottles per day. Um, a single harvest from our larger cartridge can equal 200 roller bottles a day. Um, so it's about 100 times higher concentration than what we see in uh, versus flask or spinner culture. Um, so hollow fiber bioreactors are, you know, the method of choice for the expression of difficult to express proteins from mammalian expression systems, something that's really difficult to do otherwise. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the co-cultivation applications and uh, hopefully get some uh, nice interesting pictures. So here we talk about asymmetric cell co-cultivation. So in this particular case, we have endothelial cells on the insides of the fiber. This is a different fiber that we work with. And here we can see vascular smooth muscle on the outside of the fiber. So you can see the three-dimensional um, growth characteristics of the cells on the fiber. Um, in this particular case, we could grow endothelial cells on the inside of the fiber and subject them to chronic shear stress, defined levels of chronic shear stress as they are um, growing in vivo in the body. And shear stress is quite important to endothelial cells, and they respond to this shear stress uh, in many different ways. Um, but most specifically, they lay down flat, they form a monolayer, they form tight junctions, there's physiologic expression of Pilate bodies, um, and um, they, they stop dividing, most importantly. So I look at the endothelial cells. I don't look at endothelial cells. I look at the endothelium as an organ that's inside your body. You have about a kilogram worth of endothelial cells. 
of it line all the blood vessels. The surface area is frankly unimaginable. I see many different levels of calculation of surface area, and I'm really not sure which one is right, but a tremendous amount of surface area. And endothelial cells provide very important functions. They control um, the composition of the interstitial fluid, which cells are actually growing in, which is actually quite different than the composition of serum itself. Um, they're responsible for the blood-brain barrier. They're responsible for cancer metastasis. They're responsible for stem cell homing. Um, so the only way to really get true physiologically relevant endothelial cells is to grow them under shear. Um, in this particular case, this is showing the endothelial cells um, flattened on the insides of the fiber. It's really remarkable to me just how flat they are and how thin they are. It's amazingly thin. Um, it's not a complete monolayer in this particular case, but what we're going to be doing here is looking at cell transmigration through the fiber. Um, and uh, this is Dr. Um, Pepper and Elizabeth Walsby. They were in Wales, and now they've, she's moved on. I forget exactly where, but she's still working on the system. And what they've done is set up a model for cancer metastasis. And so they find that they put in uh, the endothelial cells and subject them to shear, and then they put a chemotactic agent on the ECS side of the fiber to attract the cancer cells of circulating leukemic lymphocytes. Um, lo and behold, they wind up showing up on the outside of the fiber. So they specifically interact with the endothelial cells in the presence of shear and are able to, and I don't know how they do this, they're able to transmigrate through a 0.1 micron tortuous path, pore size. 200 micron wall thickness and show up on the other side. And the two things that are important about this particular model is number one, um, it's a way to get enough endothelial cells and enough of the circulating leukemic lymphocytes so that you can do genetic analysis, you can do look at protein expression, you can look at the re receptor activation uh, with enough cells here. It's about 80 square centimeters of surface area. And secondly, this process is quantifiable. So they can put in drug X and say, okay, we saw an 80% reduction in cancer metastasis utilizing this drug. Um, we also have a co-cultivation where we put bone marrow stroma onto the fibers, and then we can put hematopoietic stem cells on the outside of the fiber. And this is uh, Dr. Mayaseri Lim, who did some of this work, very interesting stuff. And she found that hematopoietic stem cells cultured in this environment and grafted more rapidly when uh, injected into skid mice. Um, another application that is, um, I find very interesting and I'm happy to have been involved with, um, whenever we're working with hollow fiber, we really want to look at um, recapitulating the in vivo environment as closely as possible. So this is Dr. Nigel Yarlett, Pace University, and we work with some folks at Tufts Vet Veterinary School. And cryptosporidium is a um, unicellular parasite that has never been cultured in vitro for all of its life cycles before. So it's a uh, parasite of the gut epithelium. 40% uh, of the kids in Africa are infected with cryptosporidium. It's a wasting disease. It's kind of like cholera. It's not very pleasant at all. So we look at, the, we look at this and we say, okay, it's, it's interesting to think that actually the gut is a low oxygen environment. So what they were able to do is take um, gastric epithelial cells and put them on the outside of the fiber. And of course, the interior of the fiber is going to be a high oxygen environment. And then they devised a way to put oxygen scavengers into the extracapillary space of the fiber uh, and um, generate a low oxygen side, which is going to be mimicking the oxygen tension that you find in the gut. And it took a special lipid, lipid package and a few other things, but they were actually able to take cryptosporidium out of an animal, um, have it go through all its stages of development inside the cartridge, and then reinfect an animal. And they'd never been able to do that before. In fact, I was at the CDC just yesterday, and there was a guy who had some tremendous experience with working with cryptosporidium, and uh, uh, he still has to use cows as his vector, as his, as his, um, as his host to culture cryptosporidium. And of course, it's very difficult to develop drugs against a particular disease if you don't have a way of growing it in a lab. So this is something that I'm very proud of and I think is actually quite significant. Um, exosomes are something that's been kind of coming along just recently. It's only a few years ago. 
People thought that exosomes were just a way for cells to get rid of their um, intracellular garbage. They thought they were just uh, uh, garbage balls that use, cells would <clears throat> use to get rid of stuff they want to get rid of. The flow cytometry people would always say, uh, you know, down at the bottom of the flow plots, there'd be all these little little dots of exosomes. And like, I wish these things weren't here. What a, a pain to have them around. Um, now it seems that exosomes are involved in many, many different types of processes, um, specifically cellular regeneration, tissue regeneration, um, the environment of the circulating blood is designed to be very hostile to free RNA. We don't want to have free RNA floating around um, in the blood vessels, in the circulatory system affecting uh, cells downstream uh, unless there's a specific purpose. And exosomes are targeted vesicles about 80 to 120 nanometers in size, and they're quite complex in terms of the proteins in the membrane. I believe their primary function is to protect microRNA and ensure that it gets delivered to specific sites um, in tissues downstream. Um, so it's this ability to enhance tissue regeneration downstream um, that gives them very uh, great possibilities for different types of therapeutic applications. So. Exosomes are secreted by cells, and normally the, the standard protocol for producing them is to take a flask and grow the cells up to um, confluence, and then remove the serum and grow them in serum-depleted media, serum starvation conditions, um, because serum contains endogenous exosomes that we don't want to have to, uh, we can't purify away from. Uh, so this is not a very physiologic process, and this is some of our early data where we compared um, exosomes produced from human adipose-derived adult mesos kind of stem cells. So basically we can see that um, one C21, C2011 bioreactor over a period of six weeks of harvesting um, can produce, as, can yield as many exosomes as about 700 T225 flasks, but at a volume of only 120 mils. Uh, based upon this uh, methodology, I calculate that we can actually easily produce gram quantities of exosomes utilizing four to six of our larger cartridges. Uh, and we can do this without uh, contamination from serum uh, endogenous exosomes. Um, this is just an example of some of the things that we've done with exosomes. Of course, there's lots of other applications for exosomes. I believe we're going to see that exosomes are the prime therapeutic vector from stem cells, that the stem cells themselves are not necessarily what's um, producing the tissue regeneration, but the exosome secreted by the stem cells. So this is a poor little rat that we've got a standard model for wound healing. <clears throat> and you can see under the red circles, that's where we've applied the exosomes. And it's really not very many of them. It's around 2.5 times 10 to the 6 exosomes supplied to each wound versus the controls taking a lot longer to heal up. Um, we have collaborated with a company in North Carolina to develop some of this data, Zen Bio. And the president down there, he has a uh, sister who happens to work in the cosmetics industry. And uh, they produced so many exosomes with this cartridge. They had 25 milligrams of the stuff, and they didn't want to just throw it away. Um, so he called her up, and he said, hey, sis, you know, I got this stuff that uh, seems to stimulate collagen regeneration and tissue healing and things like that. Any ideas what to do with it? And she said, sure. Let's put it into a face cream. So there's an actual face cream on the market. It's been fully tested and validated. Um, you can order it online. This is not necessarily commercial for it. It's called ExoFace. Um, and it contains 150 million exosomes per bottle. Um, and uh, I like the term they use. It contains smarticles. And they call it Zen Cubed technology because it was the third cartridge that they used the maximum number of cells. They loaded 10 of the night cells into the cartridge, and that's how they got all these exosomes. So I believe this is the first real commercial, commercially successful application for exosomes. And I've given out a lot of samples of it to with some of my uh, female friends, and they swear by it. They think it's great stuff. Um, so the advantages in hollow fiber for exosome production is that a large number of cells can be cultured in a small space. The treated exosomes are concentrated, so we don't have large volumes of um, supernatant that we have to deal with. Um, we can do continuous production over several months. We're going to be working with a 293 or something like that. 
Um, serum can be used without contamination from endogenous exosomes, but I have to say at this point in time, I've been kind of surprised by the fact that um, we've yet to really find a cell type that we cannot adapt to CDMHD. Now, I'll be honest with you, we have not yet tried CDMHD with mesenchymal stem cells. That's still a work in progress. Um, but CDMHD has been used successfully with BHK, CHO, 293, hybridomas, um, primary cancer cells, um, and cardiac spheroids. Uh, if we can get the cells up to high density, we seem to be able to adapt them over to CDMHD. And CDMHD is going to be validated for CGMP production of exosomes. Um, cell proliferation may be limited specifically with mesenchymal stem cells, and I think they're a separate issue, and we're going to talk about that in just a few slides. And this is just a little reminder of the plastic waste that's generated by 1 times 10 to the ninth cells, generating them in standard culture methods versus our cartridge. Another, another application that I'm just going to mention, uh, it's quite significant for us um, because it allows uh, direct mimicking of human bioavailability of antibiotics and modeling pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And the basic idea is that we constrain and, and retain the bacteria inside the cartridge, and then we have a circulating loop through the central reservoir, and then we can add and remove drug from the central reservoir and the idea being that concentration of drug in the central reservoir equals concentration of drug on the bacteria so that we can look at dosing profiles that result in optimum killing. We can look at dosing profiles that result in resistance. Um, we can easily do two and three drug models, uh, which is going to be, I think, kind of the wave of the future for uh, the immediate future for antibiotic therapy as resistance is on the rise. Um, it's also a good way that we can do time course dependent, dependent treatment of um, cells, lots of cells as well. For example, one of the things that uh, we do with uh, mesenchymal stem cells and exosomes is we want to look at heat shock. So we can just take the central reservoir and put it into a 45 degree water bath um, and try doing that with 200 flasks at, at one time. Um, so this is also a way of doing time course exposure of various um, treatments to cells um, in a very defined and um, physiologically relevant fashion. Um, also, just another little reminder that uh, Fibercell is a uh, enabling supplier to NASA. But you have to think about how do you do cell culture in zero G? Everything has to be retained inside a seal system. You can't pipette in space. You can't do cell culture in space. Um, so we are an enabling supplier to NASA. So whenever you read about any cell culture experiments coming off the International Space Station, um, that'll be our cartridges that they're using for that. Um, this is my final example that I like to show for just how profoundly um, cell culture conditions can affect cell physiology and that they need to be as in vivo-like as possible. This is a very interesting piece of data that we got from some collaborators Thailand, in fact, but this is um, culturing of primary cholangiocarcinoma cells in the hollow fiber bioreactor utilizing CDMHD versus the cells being grown in flask culture. And what I find interesting about this is so what they're doing is they're looking to define a biomarker for cancer that they can use, this specific cancer that they can use um, for diagnostics uh, of cholangiocarcinoma. So what we see in, in the B is the main piece of data we want to look at. So they utilized our 5-KD molecular weight cutoff cartridge and um, concentrated and collected uh, the secretome of the cells. And they utilized CDMHD um, to culture the cells. So any protein present here in the ECS is going to be secreted from the cells. And they also defined the low amount of apoptosis. So these are um, really... Uh, a reflection of the secreted products not without without a lot of intracellular protein um, contamination. So if we were just simply concentrating the secretome from these cells, then all the proteins along should be concentrated to the same degree. But in point of fact, the one protein at NGAL is 56 times more secreted in hollow fiber in three-dimensional culture than in flask culture. So it's this cell culture environment is causing these cells to behave more physiologically because then they went back and started looking at serum 
a concentration of different proteins and found that in point of fact, NGAL was extremely elevated in circulating, um, cir uh, circulating plasma of the patients, and they wouldn't have picked this up if they were doing this in flask culture. So just one example, another example of how profoundly cell culture conditions can affect the behavior and physiology of the cells. All right, and then we're going to get my last example. What we were looking at is we were looking at um, a source for stem cells. So the placenta is a great source for stem cells. There's not a lot of ethical issues that are raised around it. And so we thought, all right, whenever we're working with hollow fiber, we want to try to recapitulate the in vivo situation as much as possible. So what we thought was, okay, let's just take a placenta. And we found that if we utilize pulsatile perfusion, we would get better perfusion of the placenta itself. So we utilized one of our duet pumps to pulsatile perfuse placenta. First, we did it with PBS, 24 hours. And yeah, you can just hook it up to a tube and ligate it up, and you can pump things right through the placenta. It comes out the other end. Uh, so we started off with PBS. We wanted to get rid of the cord blood and the CD34. We're not interested in that. And then we take collagenase. And we circulate collagenase for an hour, and we just digest up the placenta. The idea was we wanted to get all the different cell types that were present. So we wanted to be sure to get the endothelial cells. I think they were important. We wanted to get trophoblasts. They may be in there. We want to get the stem cells. Whatever we can get, we want to get a mixed population of cells and put it into the hollow fiber bioreactor. And uh, I've submitted this grant several times to the Maryland Stem Cell Commission, and every time it comes back saying, this is non-hypothesis-based science, and I'm here to tell you I'm a big fan of non-hypothesis-based science at times. Um, so we took all these cells and we just dumped them into the 5KD cartridge. We wanted to um, enhance cell-to-cell -cell interaction, concentrate any cytokines that the cells might be secreting. So we put it into 5KD cartridge, and then the first three days we would just gently flush it out to remove the non-adherent cells. Then after about a week, um, we started to see these red blobs, these red nodules forming on the fiber. And we had a new crop of suspension cells that were being harvested out of the cartridge. Remember, they're in a 3D environment, they're suspension cells coming out of the cartridge. Um, so these cells are kind of small in diameter, um, somewhat reminiscent of Ranichak's very small embryonic-like stem cells. We take these cells that are in suspension, and we put them on a flask with 5% serum, and all of a sudden they attach to the flask and they look a lot like mesenchymal stem cells, complete with um, erythroid bodies forming, three-dimensional erythroid bodies. Um, so this is kind of an interesting question that you run into. If you have cells, and you're not really sure what their source is, how are you going to define them? So basically what we did was just went to the freezer and took any of the markers we could find and things that we thought might be good. So we can see the different markers that we tried. Um, and the ECS harvest are these suspension cells that are coming out of the cartridge, suspension cells. Um, and uh, we can see they're kind of phenotypically indistinct. CD105 is going to be the highest one. That's both an MSC marker and an endothelial marker. But then we take these cells, we put them into a flask, um, and then three days later, in the presence of serum and two-dimensional non-porous plastic support, we can see that these cells are now 99% MSC um, positive. So another just extreme example, I believe, of just how important cell culture conditions are, how profoundly the culture conditions can affect cell phenotype and physiology. So in summary, thanks everybody for hanging in there this long. Um, hollow fiber bioreactors are the method of choice for the culture of 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 11 cells. It's an easy way for any lab to handle large numbers of cells. It's ideal for producing 100 megs to several grams of a monoclonal antibody, 10 to hundreds of megs of recombinant protein. The concomitant concentration of products 10 to 100 times higher than with conventional methods. And most importantly, it's the most in vivo-like method for culturing cells over long periods of time, extended periods of time. And it's also going to save you time, space, and purification costs. So it should be clear that Hollow fiber bioreactors are the most evolved way of growing cells, and it's the most in vivo-like way of growing cells uh, in the laboratory versus these other methods that are limited in their relevance to physiology, depending on what it is you're doing. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you, John. 
As a reminder to our audience, you may ask questions at any time using the question box. Feel free to submit them now, and we'll get to them at the end of the Q&A. Uh, John, our first question here. What's the primary barrier to adoption of hollow fiber cultures? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What do you think is the primary barrier to the wide adoption of hollow fiber culture systems? I think there's, there's two things that are involved. Um, first off, uh, there has not yet been a linear scale-up path to industrial production utilizing a hollow fiber bioreactor. Uh, and we have, uh, in a different sister organization, this under development. Um, I think, secondly, um, it is a little more complex. It does require a significant amount of user intervention. And it seems to be, which seems very simple to me, but I work with it for, you know, every day for 20 years. So, it's, so what we find when I work with people um, is the more familiar they are with standard cell culture methods, the less facile they are with hollow fiber because there are some, many things that are kind of counterintuitive to it. Um, so just the concept of, you know, measuring the glucose and, gosh, look at all these tubings. And, uh, you know, I have some people say, well, I don't understand how it's getting oxygen, so they leave the cap unscrewed and then everything gets uncontaminated. I think, I think um, up until now we've been a technique of last resort. Um, and I believe that with the, uh, it actually is not that difficult to be working with once somebody gets a handle on it um, and works it a little bit. They don't understand why people would use anything else. Thank you. We just got another question in. How easy is it to harvest cells from a hollow fiber bioreactor versus dishes or flasks? This is the one area where hollow fiber is not ideally suited to match up with standard flask culture. It's not a great method for harvesting cells, depending on what it is that you're doing. And this is because the cells are growing in multiple layers. Trypsin is very effective at separating cells from plastic, but trypsin is not very effective at separating cells from each other. Um, so the cells grow in very dense bundles, multiple layers. Um, we're working on this uh, for other applications to try to make it easier. We find it depends on the cell type, um, and it also is going to depend a lot on if we can get them into CDMHD. So something like a 293 cell, we can easily harvest lots of cells. But in terms of generating cell mass, um, it's really an ideal way of working with things. Thank you for clearing that up. To your knowledge, have any FDA-approved drugs been developed or produced in a fiber cell bioreactor? In a fiber cell bioreactor, no. We have some um, initial work with uh, phase one clinical trials that we're beginning to work on a little bit. Um, but about 10 years ago, I can't remember the name of the company now, but there was um, a company that got a drug, monoclonal antibody drug approved um, by the FDA produced in a hollow fiber bioreactor system. Um, we have a great interest in facilitating this and making this happen. I think that um, the primary uh, application we're most interested in is going to be the exosome application because this is one where utilizing current available off-the-shelf technology, um, we can produce sufficient therapeutic amounts for it to be um, relevant for uh, therapy. I mean, if you make a gram of exosomes, that's going to be, you know, potentially thousands of doses uh, of exosomes. Excellent. Thank you. Can you share the story of how you arrived at the formulation of your CDMHD serum replacement? Am I sure of the story? <laughs> no, can, 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 you, can you share the story? Of oh, how you share the story. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> if I'm sure of it, well, uh, well, um, that's interesting. I'll try not to go too long about it, but I will. I will, you know go all the way back to working with Richard Nasik and and you know previous cell culture companies. And at the time, we knew that we could more easily adapt cells to serum-free media, the commercially available serum-free medias at the time, um, and we could reduce the amount of serum utilized from 10% down to 2% if we needed to, um, and. Uh, basically, the story was that uh, I had a friend and a collaborator who worked at a uh, major cell culture media company, 
that supplied serum and also expensive serum-free medias, and he had developed basically a product that was intended to replace serum and not be as expensive as serum and not be as expensive as serum-free media. And so the company really wasn't interested in developing this. So we looked at the formulation for this. He had a lot of experience with, with uh, cell culture media formulation. And we kind of looked at it, and I looked at it and said, okay, well, gee, we'd like to throw some heaps in here because uh, we want to stabilize the pH a little bit. We want a little extra glucose. Let's put a lot of amino acids in. Um, you know, the iron situation, there's a lot of different ways of working with iron, and that was the hardest part to get to get optimized because we have no transferrin. Uh, so we actually wind up with quite a bit of free iron, which is something to be, be cognizant of when you're working with it. Um, and so we, basically we had a base formula of something that was kind of in that area um, and uh, manipulated it um, and, and found that it uh, was very surprisingly easy to get cells to grow with this stuff in hollow fiber at high density. Uh, a high density culture of the cells are going to auto-stimulate utilizing their own cytokines um, and it really mitigates differences between different types of media. Um, so in the serum-free media range, I mean, you have stuff developed specifically for CHO and stuff developed specifically for 293 and stuff developed specifically for hybridoma. Um, and the high density seems to uh, kind of uh, mitigate these differences. And it's really surprising to me how uh, many different cell types we can get to, do, to adapt to it. One thing about CDMHD is it does not contain any lipids. So there are some cell lines um, that are cholesterol-dependent. Um, so in this case, like NS0s, um, human heterohybridomas, they're going to require a little bit of supplementation with, uh, with serum, 0.5%, uh, because the synthetic cholesterol in most serum-free medias are going to be bound up with cyclodextran, and cyclodextran cholesterol complexes bind to silicone. This is uh, a common problem, not just for us, but anybody doing these cell culture bags. So I think the, uh, the big part of the story is luck and serendipity, and I'm a big fan of serendipity. Who isn't? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Our next question, um, you mentioned that protein folding is improved in hollow fiber bioreactors. Does that include disulfide bond formation? Does that include what? Disulfide bond formation. Um, I can't address that specifically. I'm going to say probably because I think it's all post-translational modifications, um, but we've been working with a couple of different companies that are doing things like these bites, these bispecific T-cell enhancers, and these trikes, these tri-specific NK um, enhancers. Um, and uh, we've had several discussions with these people that are developing them for clinical applications, and they're telling me that they can't produce them in standard spinner and, and, uh, and bioreactor culture. Um, and so these are, there's an article, I think it's one of the ones that, are, that, are, that is downloaded, or there's one that I just wrote for, for Jen on difficult to express proteins. And there's a lot more detail in that, and I think that's on our website in terms of these, you know, well, there's a big trend towards, you know, not just producing proteins that are, you know, created in nature and, and, and um, producing them for therapeutics, but now designing new proteins that have, um, amino acid sequences and structures that are not found, that are not naturally occurring, and it's going to be a little bit difficult for some, you know, cell machinery to kind of choke on it a little bit. Uh, but we find in, uh, in the hollow fiber system that we can readily express these very complex proteins. Uh, but specifically disulfide bonds and, and methylations and things, we haven't looked at that. We're just looking at the overall structure in probably a fairly crude way. I would welcome anybody who wanted to take a look at it in more detail. All right, great. Do you have any experience producing prions in these bioreactors? I have no experience. It's the first time I've heard of it, but it sounds like a great idea. All right, great. Um, we have a couple more questions, and if anyone has any additional questions that they'd like to send our way, please feel free to put them into the question box and send them. Um, given your wound healing example, is it possible to, say, impregnate a bandage with exosomes and uh, benefit from that improved healing? Um, that's an idea that I've had. Um, I like it because you don't have to get any FDA approval. Um, it's interesting to me 
uh, than the case of ExoFace that, well, it's a darn good face cream. Are the exosomes actually doing anything? Uh, I believe yes. Um, is there a way to um, preserve activity on a bandage? I think that since the exosome membrane is mainly protecting the mRNA in, in the circulatory system, that the microRNA may be stable on a bandage. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's uh, a viable thing and something that I've looked at. There are some clinical trials specifically looking at uh, uh, diabetic-associated ulcers and wound healing with that. Um, but is it going to be a controlled FDA study? I'm not exactly sure what, what the prognosis of this is right now. Great. And now we have time for just one more question. Could hollow fiber bioreactors be a reasonable method for recapitulating myelination in vitro? Um, I would have to say possibly. Um, the, the, there's so many different 3D models that one could look at. The question is how do you quantify them? Um, I will just put in a little plug right now because I didn't talk about it too much um, in, the, in the talk, but we have this little cartridge that's always been my favorite one. It's the C2025. And it's got, it's what we use for endothelial cell culture, but it's, it's made out of PVDF, or polyvinylidene difluoride, so it's just like a blotting membrane. So I think that one of the things that's missing from a lot of these 3D models that people are looking at is, is the interaction between uh, the cells and um, solid phase bound cytokines and cell markers and, and matrix and things like that. So the PVDF fiber, you can wet out with alcohol and put down any kind of protein that you might like on it. Um, and we can more closely look at it. And I'm not really familiar with the process of myelination. I do know that nerves are not going to proliferate. Um, and I know that people have not really used the cartridges at this point in time for culturing neuronal cells because you really want to be able to see the cells and hollow fiber is not a real good way to be seeing the cells visually. Right. Um, I think I think the thought process there was that you could have you know sort of the supporting trophic factors inside the capillaries leading the oligodendrocytes to wrap around and um, you know maybe mistake the fibers as axons. Um, just something I to would, think about in the future. I definitely, we'll have to think about it. Yeah. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to John directly. His email is shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and you'll receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the Scientist, I'd also like to thank our speaker, John Cadwell, as well as our webinar sponsor, FiberCell Systems. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye.